Welcome to the Radiant Vista. I'm Mark Johnson and today I'm going to do a video tutorial on portrait retouching. In a recent workbench I did some portrait retouching and in that workbench I think, if I recollect correctly, I think I mentioned that I was going to show you at some point in time a few other retouching secrets. And this image was sent to me by a photographer in Boulder, Colorado, by the name of Tim Benko. Tim is a wonderful portrait photographer, and I just want to thank him for submitting this image and allowing me to go in and really muck it up and make it look bad here so that I can go in and start correcting some things. So in this tutorial, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use the liquify feature in Photoshop to slim or enhance features. I'm also going to show you what you can do to add in a catch light to an image that doesn't have catch lights in the eyes. Then I'm going to go into a little bit of color correcting by the numbers and I'm going to reference a Katrin Eisman book for that. And we're going to go in and color correct by the numbers and if we have time, if I haven't rambled on too long, I might show you how to replace that background with something else. So that's where we're headed in this particular video tutorial and let me get started with the liquify feature that we can use to enhance or slim features. So if we're going to run liquify on this image what I'm going to start off doing is duplicating the background layer. So I'll go layer duplicate layer and I'll call this one liquify to indicate that's what I'm running on it. I'll click OK and now I'm going to go into the Liquify dialog box and I'll warn you in advance this is a very large dialog box and I can't fit it all into this small space that I have to work with here so I'm going to have to uh, maybe tell you about a few things that you can't see or you can barely see so where you find Liquify is under the filter menu and you choose Liquify right here brings up the Liquify dialog box and you can see the image right here and you have all of the tools here and actually you have access to most of the things that I'm gonna show you in this particular tutorial. I'm just gonna give you kind of an overview of how you can use Liquify to enhance or diminish features. So this is the way Liquify works. Um, you have a variety of tools up here and if you point to them it'll tell you what they are but you have a whole variety of tools that allow you to essentially shape the image. You can shape it, you can uh, bloat it, you can shrink it, you can do all types of things to the image and once you decide what you need to do to change your image or in this case to modify the portrait uh, you can pick the right tool for the job. So what I'm going to do here in this particular tutorial is I'm going to see if I can't bend this very flat look in the mouth here into a little bit, a, a kind of a subtle smile I'm going to come in and take this nose, which is actually a, 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 an ideal nose, but I'm going to take that and I'm going to shrink it down so I can show you how to do that. And then I'm going to take these eyes and slightly enlarge them because big eyes uh, really catch a person's attention when you're working with a portrait. So we'll do those three things while we're here in the Liquify dialog box. What I'm going to do first is see if I can't bend this into a very subtle smile. And to do that, I'm going to come up here to this particular tool called Forward Warp. And I'm going to move it down over this. And um, I can change my brush size with a slider that I have right over here. So I can slide this left or right. Or the way, another way to do it um, that I like personally is I hold down the Shift key and use the right bracket key to make it incrementally larger. So it's going up in steps of, I believe, 20. Yep, 20 increments there. And if I do shift and the left bracket key, it goes down in increments of 20. And so I think that's a nicer way to do it than having to move over here and constantly change your brush size with the slider. So I'm going to make this about that size right there. I'll just go a little bit larger. I, I let go of the shift key to just very subtly change the size. And now what I can do is I can come in here to the edge of the mouth and I can slightly move it. Now that didn't work out so well. I need to come closer to the end. And you can see I'm clicking and I'm dragging. Now let me do that. Let me go over the top. You can see I can you can really muck things up if you're not very careful when you do this. 
but there I was able to bend things up just a little bit so that we have a little bit of curvature to the mouth right there. Of course, it'd be nice to see some teeth. That's something for a whole different tutorial, but it'd be nice to see some teeth in there as well. Actually, that'd be something for a reshoot. <laughs> All right, next thing that I want to do is come in here and shrink the nose. Now, to do this, I'm going to try and take care of the entire nose at one time. And if I'm not careful, what's going to happen is I'm going to end up um, affecting the eyes and potentially this area above the lip here. So I want to freeze those areas. And there's this choice right here called Freeze Mask. And I can click on that, and this allows me to freeze or protect certain areas. So I have got that selected. And down here, you can barely see this, but there's a button that says Show Mask. And I can switch that on, and this will show you what I'm freezing or protecting here. I'm going to make my brush a little bit bigger with Shift and the right bracket. And I'm going to come around here, and I'm going to protect these areas outside of what I'm trying to affect, which is the nose. All right, so those areas are now protected. I can switch off Show Mask. Now, to shrink the nose, there's a tool up here called Pucker and Bloat. Bloat will make it larger. Pucker will make it smaller. Now, since I want to do the whole nose in one fell swoop, I'm going to make my brush even bigger. And since I protected those areas, I'm not worried about going too big here. Actually, that's a little too large. That's about perfect. Now, when I click on the nose, one click makes it go from here to here. So let's just click and hold down a little bit. So you can see, with that little move, I was able to shrink the nose from here to here. So that's a, a nice way to do that. Now let's do the opposite for the eyes, but the eyes right now are frozen. So what I can do is I can come over here to Thaw Mask, and I can paint that frozen area away. Maybe here I want to freeze the nose so that I don't affect the nose anymore when I deal with the eyes. So I'll just come in here and freeze this area right through here. Okay, if I want to make the eyes a little bit larger, then what I'll do is I'll come over here to the bloat tool, choose that, make my brush just a little bit larger than the eyes, and let me show you. If I click and hold down and let this go way too far so it looks crazy, uh, you have an option here right below the top tool. This option right here is called Reconstruct. And I can come in here and I can reconstruct anything that I made a mistake on. So that's one nice way of getting back to where you were if you make a mistake. So let's go back here to the Bloat tool. I don't want to go too large on the eye. Just a couple clicks just to slightly open up those eyes. Now they look odd because they don't have a catch light in there, so they definitely need work. In fact, a lot of things in this picture need work right now. All right, next thing I'm going to do, I'll switch off masks. So at this point, I enlarged the eyes. I shrunk the nose. So I enlarged these with the bloat tool. I shrunk the nose with this tool right here, the pucker tool. And then I curled up the ends of the mouth using the forward warp tool. Uh, these tools also work if you're trying to get rid of um, unsightly lines in the body. Uh, you can do things like that. So it's all possible here within Liquify if you need to get in and do some retouching work of this nature. Now I'm going to press OK and the Liquify is complete. And You can see my before and after because I duplicated my layer and named it Liquify. So there's where we started and there's where we are now. So it's a subtle improvement to the image. You can have a lot of fun with Liquify, I think. Now, let's move on to the next thing that I want to cover, and that is how do you bring some light into these eyes? So we're going to add some catch lights into the eyes, and then I'm going to do a slight dodge to open up another portion of the iris in the eye. So to add a catch light, here's how you do this. Uh, I'm going to make a new layer, so I'll choose Layer, New Layer, and in the New Layer dialog, I'll call this Catch Lights. And I'll leave it set to normal mode for now. That could be changed later. We'll take a look and see if we need to do that. Now I'm going to press OK. Now I have this transparent catch lights layer that's ready to take some paint. So this is not an adjustment layer. It's a normal pixel bearing layer, and it can take white paint. So I want to go over here to my brush tool. I'm going to use my default color, so I'll press the D key to give me black and white. And I'll press X to exchange white to the foreground right there. 
I have 100% opacity, and that's going to be my starting point now. That's going to be too strong of an effect here, but it's okay to apply the effect too strong, and we'll reduce it later using an opacity slider, and I'll show you that. Now, what I want to do is I want to zoom up on these eyes, so I'm going to use the keyboard shortcut of spacebar and command on the Mac, or spacebar and control on the PC, and I'm going to zoom up on the eyes, nice and big, like that. And in order to achieve this, I need to use a brush, a unique brush. Um, there may be several brushes that will work for this. I'll show you one of them. I'm going to come into the Brushes palette right here. That'd be under Window Brushes if I didn't already have it available. And I'm going to choose, I'm going to scroll down this until I'm about a third of the way down. And there's something here, if I point to it, it's called Spatter 14 Pixels. I like this brush. Now, one thing about this brush, and I'm just going to paint over here and just show you how it works. You see how it's kind of got that rough texture to it? Well, one other thing I want to have happen with that brush is I want to have it fade away when I paint this catch light. So I'm going to click on Shape Dynamics, actually click on the words here, and here where it says Control, rather than Pen Pressure, which is great if you have a Wacom tablet, rather than Pen Pressure, let's choose Fade, and I'm going to fade over a certain number of pixels. Um, I don't know what it's going to be for this eye. I'll choose 10 and see how that works out. You can actually see the brush stroke down here. Now if I were to pull, you can see that it fades away as I do it. Now let me zoom up even tighter on this eye. And I'm going to have the catch light curling in from the left because I think that will be fairly consistent with the light source in this scene. I'm making the brush even smaller with my left bracket key. And you'll see here that when I paint, I can get that nice curvature. I pull a slight curve through there and I get a catch light in the eye. Come over here, do the same thing. And you'll also notice that my painting is disappearing because I'm fading out after a certain number of pixels. So I'm going to make that 8 on this eye and let it fade out just a little bit faster. And there we go. Now you can look into those eyes and you can see that they have catch lights in them. Now if I had a catch light shining into the eye right here, then I'd probably have a lightening of the iris right down here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to brush presets here, which shows me all of my normal brushes, or actually all of my brushes, and I'll scroll up until I come to any soft edge brush, don't care which one it is, just any one that says soft round. I'm going to use that in just a moment, but before I do that, I want to go back into the Layers palette and create a brand new layer that I'm going to use for dodging and burning. And I think I covered this in a previous workbench, but a little repetition might be a good thing here. So to add a brand new layer that's going to be my dodge and burn layer, I'll choose Layer, New Layer, and I'll call this Dodge and Burn, and I'm just going to do the dodging end or the lightning end, and I'm only going to do it in the eye for this tutorial. And I'll change my mode here to soft light. If you think portraiture, that'll remind you you need soft lighting. So we'll choose soft light and click OK. And now since I'm in soft light blending mode on this layer, if I use the brush tool to paint with white, what it does is it lightens things up. And let me just show you. You can see how it just lightens things up. And if I have black instead, that darkens things down. So it's dodging and burning on this unique layer. And what I want to do is lighten this area right here up. So I'm going to swap back to white by hitting the X key. And I'm going to come down in here. Now, if I paint with 100%, that is too intense right here. But this needs um, a good dose. So I'm going to try maybe 50%. And you can always make this a lower percentage up here for your brush um, and then just build the pressure or build the uh, intensity of the paint by going over it time and again or letting your finger off the mouse between steps. But I'm going to try and do this in one fell swoop. I think 50 is too intense. I'm going to tap the 4 key on my keyboard and go to 40. That I feel good about. I'm going to come over here and do the same thing opposite this catch light right there. Now if I zoom this back Let me go to about right here. Now if I switch these two layers on and off, you can see there's where we started with very flat eyes that didn't have any depth or, or um, 
uh, light within them, and now we've enlivened them. Of course, that's something you'd love to do with a flash if you have the choice when you're photographing, but if you can't do it with a flash, then you can come in after the fact in Photoshop and add some depth and some light to your eyes. So the next thing that I want to cover in this particular tutorial is color correcting by the numbers. And you can see that this gentleman has um, uh, magenta, slight, maybe reddish, maybe even a hint of blue cast going on in his skin. And so I am going to uh, show you how you can, or I'm going to show you a kind of a little primer here on how you can color correct by the numbers for skin tones. And um, a lot of what I've learned about this, I learned from reading a book called Photoshop Restoration and Retouching by Katrina Eisman. And it's a great book if you do a lot of retouching work. I would recommend it. And she has a section in there where she addresses balancing skin tones. And uh, she actually gives you some RGB and CMYK numbers to work with. So you have some great starting points. Um, inside that book. She also recommends creating a skin tone um, patch document so that if you're working with a child um, or an average Caucasian skin person or a tanned Caucasian or if you're working with a darker skin person um, or somebody with Asian descent you have all these choices you can build patches and I'll show you how how you do that you can build patches that you can use as references both in terms of the color numbers and in terms of just visually seeing them on screen but you can use those as color references when you're doing skin tone color balancing so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use um, some numbers that she has here in the book uh, this is what we would call probably average Caucasian skin and average Caucasian skin on, in a person this age, it's going to tend, let me, let me get the info palette out here before I jump ahead of myself. Let's get info palette out and let's move that down just a bit. Uh, if I move over a, a, an average portion of the skin here, not a shadow, not a highlight, and, and not um, an area of makeup, then you'll see uh, I have certain RGB numbers, red, green, and blue numbers in my info palette, and certain CMYK numbers in my info palette. Now, um, what Katrine says in the book is that um, a young Caucasian baby will have light skin that has equal amounts of yellow and magenta without any cyan or black. But as a person um, gets older, as a person matures, the amount of yellow will increase in relationship to the amount of magenta in the skin. And she gives you some numbers here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go with her numbers for an average average Caucasian. And so I'm going to work toward um, red, green, and blue numbers of 213 red, 172 green, and 129 blue. And I work toward those. Uh, and we're going to see how this works out. Sometimes I find, based upon the individual, I'll start with these numbers and then I end up kind of refining the adjustments a little bit until I get exactly what I want. So to balance by the numbers here, I'm going to come down to the eyedropper or the turkey baster. Click and hold down on that and choose the color sampler tool. Move over top of this gentleman's face. Click on an average area. Now you can see down here I have a color sampler point number one, and it's giving me red, green, and blue values. Now, the ones that I'm after are 213, 172, and 129. So we'll see how those work out. I'm going to come up here to Layer, New Adjustment Layer, and choose Curves. And we're going to call this Skin Tone Adjustment. And I'll click OK. And I've got my Curves dialog box here. We're really running out of space. Um, if I want to place a sample point on the curve for the red, green, and blue channel, there's one nice little shortcut to do that. If I move over top of this existing sampler point that I have in the picture there, and I hold down, I think it is, yes, it's, it's going to be Command and Shift on the Mac, or it's going to be Control and Shift on the PC. While I'm in the RGB channel up there in Curves, if I click now, I see nothing change on the RGB channel itself, but if I examine the red, green, and blue channels independently, I can see that those points are on each one of those channels just with that one click. So I held down Control Shift or Command Shift and clicked on this particular point and it applied those points to the curve. So let's start with the red channel. 
it says here that my that I'm trying to get to 213. Well, my starting point is should be 219, so I'm going to go ahead and change this. That's going to change it slightly there. So my input or my starting point is at 219, and on my finishing point, I'm going to head toward 213. I'm going to use my previous switch, which you can't see unless I move this over a little bit. Let's see if we can make everything fit in here in this nice tight space. So you can see that pulled out some of the red. That's a good move. Now I'm going to go on to green. And my starting point should be 154. So I'll type in 154. And my output point, according to these numbers in the ro restoration and retouching book, should be 172. Now I'll click the preview switch and you can see here's a starting point and here's a finishing point. And wow, that made a huge difference in these skin tones. Now let's go on to the final channel, the blue channel. My starting point should be 160. Type in 160 and my finishing point for this one should be 129. That's going to be a dramatic difference. Uh, actually, that added a ton of yellow and in my opinion, it's too much yellow. Uh, I don't like having quite that much yellow in this skin tone here. So I'm going to take click on that point and I'm going to move it up gradually until I have something that I feel good about. I'll use my preview switch here, see where I started and where I am. And I think that's a pretty realistic skin tone right there. So I went with those numbers that were in the book and um, they worked out pretty well for me. Uh, I did need to do a little bit of adjusting in order to get things set up even better. I'll press OK. And you can see there's where we started, here's where we are. Now if anything else in the picture um, outside of the skin tone looked bad at this point, then I would use this mask and a black brush and I would paint those areas to restore them back to the way I want them to be. But in this case, I like them better now. So I'm going to go with what I have. All right, to get rid of this point right here, what you can do with this tool still active, with the color sampler tool still active, you can press clear. And that will wipe out any points that are sitting on there. By the way, those are all non-printing points. They won't show up in your prints. All right, let's look at how you would create a document that contains representative skin tones if you do a lot of portrait retouching. So here's how you do this. Come up here to the rectangular marquee tool. So I clicked and held down because I had the elliptical marquee selected. Come to the rectangular marquee and then drag across a representative portion of the skin. So this would be sort of average Caucasian skin um, in this age range. So I'll pull that out. Now what I want to do is I want to copy this off and put it into a new document that I'm going to keep around as a reference document. Since I have all these layers on here, to pull it out I need to choose Edit Copy Merged and that's going to copy all of these layers into that one area right there. So everything that is, is happening within my layers palette here in terms of the color correction is now being copied onto the clipboard. Now I'm going to make a new document, so I'll choose File and New. And I'll come in here. It's going to um, automatically, by default, it's going to try to give us a document size that is a dead-on match to the area that we just selected a moment ago. Well, we don't want that because we're going to put lots of swatches in here. So we'll call this uh, Skin Tone Squat. Uh, swa <laughs> I can't talk. Swatches. There we go. Skin Tone Swatches. I'll change this from Pixels to Inches. And let's just go ahead and make this document like a 4 inch by 4 inch. Because I'm dealing with a low res file right now, I'm going to leave this set to 72. You'll probably want to have it set to something like 300 or 360 because you're going to be dealing with high res files. I'll click OK and I have my new document right here. Now I'm going to choose Edit Paste and there is the swatch from the skin. Now if I need to make it a little bit larger, I can always choose Edit transform and scale and I can hold down the shift key although that's not really important here I don't have to confine myself or constrain my proportions and make it a little bit bigger and press return on the Mac or enter on a PC and since that's on its own layer right there because I did an edit paste I can use the move tool and I pressed V to get to that and I can position this right over here like that now if I want this to look more even so it doesn't have the texture of the skin which is going to give me a better color sample what I can do 
is I can start by selecting this area by holding down the Apple key, the Command key on a Mac, or Control key on a PC, and click on the thumbnail here, the layer thumbnail. What that does is it makes a selection of the opaque areas and it ignores the transparent areas. Now I'll come up under Filter and I'll choose Blur, Gaussian Blur. And in the Gaussian Blur dialog box, I will set this so that it's blurring away the texture so I can get a better, more accurate sample when I use this in the future. I'll press OK. The texture is gone. I can get rid of the selection. Choose Select, Deselect. And when I'm using this in the future and I want to read those numbers, I simply come to my eyedropper tool here, move over, actually sorry, I have to make this info palette visible again, move over that skin patch and I can see the numbers in, down there in the info palette. I have a red of 213, a green of 172, and a blue of 139. And I can also position this next to the face and look at how the two are matching up. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention at the very beginning of this tutorial is when you're dealing with the eyedropper and the color sampler tools, make sure your sample size up here reads 3x3 three three average. That's very important. That means you're getting a more representative 9 pixel sample rather than a single pixel when you do your color sampling. Anyway, you could continue to add in other swatches for other uh, types of people into this particular skin tone swatch document and at some point in time you'd have something that would be a great reference for doing all of your portrait retouching um, or in this case portrait color correction. Alright so this image is by no means perfect at this point but we have at least corrected the skin tones um, by the numbers and you can see the difference there. We've added in some depth to the eyes right here with a catch light and a dodge and burn layer. And we modified some features, made them larger, smaller, or bent them around a little bit using Liquify. So our difference right now, if I hold down the Option key and click on, or Alt on the PC and click on this eyeball next to background, that's where we started and here's where we are. Now a lot of other things could happen to this portrait to make it stronger, but uh, for now I think we're going to wrap up the tutorial and I'm just going to tell you all how much I appreciate you being part of the Radiant Vista community and spending time with me here on RV. I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye.